Good afternoon, everyone. As Evan said, my name is Albert, and I am delighted and honored to host this panel, which is ambitiously titled, What to Know About Zero Knowledge. But first, I need to apologize to all the cryptographers out there. Oops, we did it again. We took a term from cryptography and, how should I say it, expanded what it means. Uh, and I'm, I'm very sorry, even though it wasn't my fault, not even one bit. It's actually more of these guys' fault. Uh, but I apologize nonetheless. You see, as cryptographers so often remind me, this already happened with the word crypto. A long time ago, like six whole years ago, crypto used to mean cryptography. But now, it generally refers to a much broader set of things, such as cryptocurrency or just this kind of circularly defined quote unquote crypto space. And here, in a case of history, if not repeating, then at least rhyming, something similar has happened with the term zero knowledge or ZK. When I thought about this, I was like, it's almost like someone somewhere went through an escalating series of dares. Like, I dare you to hijack the meaning of the word crypto. Oh, you did it? Well, that was too easy, because you know the word cryptocurrency even has crypto in it. How about you do something really ridiculous, like take an objectively defined term, such as zero knowledge, and repurpose it to include stuff that is literally not at all zero knowledge. And so that is the first thing to know about zero knowledge. It no longer means zero knowledge in a technical sense only. Rather, zero knowledge, or ZK, has morphed into referring to just about anything that utilizes certain proof techniques, proof techniques that give you actual zero knowledge in some, but definitely not all cases. So to summarize, ZK used to mean zero knowledge, as in I am able to prove that I know something without revealing anything beyond that fact. But in practice, ZK now tends to refer to a broader usage of proof techniques that have some important properties. Now, what are these properties? A very incomplete list includes precision, correctness, and succinctness. For example, when ZK is used for privacy, that's an example of high precision because you can provide better privacy when you are more precise about what information is exchanged. And succinctness is another way of saying that in some instances, ZK is used as this compression super weapon. Now, compression is super important, especially in a blockchain context, because as we know, the cost of storing data can be quite high. And so that's why, for example, a ZK rollup doesn't actually provide privacy. Rather, it provides a more succinct guarantee of correctness. Anyway, enough about how I think about ZK. My thoughts are both surely flawed and incomplete, which is why I have these three fine gentlemen up here with me today, Gub Sheep, Barry, Vitalik, thank you so much for joining. Every time we chat, I learn a ton and have a lot of fun, so I'm excited to have another conversation. I hope everyone here enjoys it as much as I will. So let's start with some introductions, specifically Gubsheep and Barry, since I figure people are a little bit familiar with Vitalik. Um, Gubsheep, Barry, can you share a bit more about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Start with you, Gubsheep. Cool. Hey, everyone. Uh, I'm Gub Sheep. I work with the Zero X Park Foundation along with Justin Glibert uh, and a handful of other folks. Um, on the day-to-day, -day, most of our projects are focused on some combination of what we call application-level R&D. And what this roughly means is trying to skate to where the puck is going on, you know, if Ethereum slash public blockchain slash new primitives from applied cryptography get, let's say, 100x better over the next two to five years, what is that really going to unlock? So we help support this, you know, relatively tightly knit, but, uh, you know, loosely associated group of teams working on anything from applications of zero knowledge cryptography to uh, crypto native gaming or what we're currently calling autonomous worlds. Yeah, so I'm Barry. I work with the PSE team at the Ethereum Foundation. And basically, we work on applying uh, zero knowledge proofs to uh, achieve both private, uh, private and scaling applications. So some of our projects include like ZKVM. We also have some like private voting, some private coercion resistant voting stuff. Um, 
uh, yeah, that's that's mostly what we work on. I also work with other people in the ecosystem to to build these tools out. I'm in fact having a lot of fun working with some of the people in Zero Spark on several different things at the moment. Yeah, speaking of which, one of the things I really love about both PSE and Zero X Park is you both have a desire to solve what I would characterize as the actual problems, you know, as opposed to settling for these like superficial or, or defensible solutions. And I've seen both of the, the groups or really the collections of people demonstrate this deep sense of responsibility for how to go about doing things and a willingness to prioritize this like collective good. So I just want to say on behalf of the broader ZK ecosystem, which as I noted, we kind of repurposed to mean something bigger now, uh, we're really lucky to have both these groups and, and thank you very much for that. Um, and so on that note, let's dive in on, on the core topics here today. Uh, one way that I like to learn about a topic is to ask people who know more about that topic than me, which definitely includes all three of these folks here, uh, I like to ask people what has been surprising to them? What has surprised them? And so when it comes to ZK, what has been surprising over, let's say, the last three years? You know, it's been three whole years since the last DevCon. That's a long time anywhere, but especially in uh, this space. Um, and so, again, I'll, I'll kick things off with Gubsheet, but we'll kind of have an open conversation from here. Yeah, this is super interesting to me because actually it was around the time of the last DevCon in 2019. <clears throat> that I was first getting involved in the space to begin with uh, and when my like zero knowledge journey was first starting and at the time the thing that drew me in was basically <clears throat> a set of tools uh, built by the folks at IDEN3, uh, CIRCOM and SNARK.js which enabled for the first time browser based proving and uh, in browser ZK applications that were if not developer friendly at least like developer possible. Um, you know you didn't have to like roll your own cryptography for the first time. And the thing that's just been continually shocking to me is, and I mean, it was true at the time and it continues to be true today, is I think that a lot of people find zero knowledge to be a very scary term. Uh, it seems like, oh, you know, this is moon math, this is something you need like, uh, you know, specialization in number theory to understand. But really there's just so many ways to get started with zero knowledge and so many things that you can build and contribute to depending on whatever level of the stack it is that you have expertise on. Um, and, you know, the space has just been surprisingly accessible for both math and CS uh, technical generalists overall. I'd say the second thing that kind of, you know, is very complementary to that is that uh, as a result, the space has been moving much more quickly than we originally, or at least I initially would have expected. Um, I know Barry has a lot to say about like ZK EVM with respect to this, but, you know, I look at my old notes from like 2020 or 2021 when I'm trying to flesh out what are some of the open like application level R&D directions. And I remember like last year I, I wrote something like um, we had a student, uh, Pei Yuan, who built out linear regression inside of a snark. And, we were thinking, oh, you know, maybe like five years in the future, it'll be possible to put a neural network in the snark. And, you know, lo and behold, actually this past Sunday, which was like not even a year from when I'd written that, um, we had two teams that presented on their work on building like MNIST and, you know, various classifiers inside of the Halo 2 proving system. So this stuff just keeps accelerating and accelerating and accelerating. Yeah, so thank you, Brian. Um, like just to build on what you said, I think that like, on your first point about like getting into the space, I think one of the like most powerful ways you can get in now, because we have all of these high level tools, you can black box out a lot of the crypto components. It makes it a lot more accessible. Um, okay, but to answer the original question, the thing that most surprised me was, uh, yeah, so for three years ago, I didn't really think that ZKVM was possible. I thought that it was like just gonna be prohibitively expensive and like, it, over the last three years, I've sort of learned that like, oh, well, actually, we, there's a whole bunch of extra scope to kind of optimize and improve the way that we can arithmetize things. So that makes me like very optimistic for the future when like, okay, we, okay, I, I, I think that we can do ZK AVM now. And I, I like the next set of things that are going to be difficult, like neural networks and like private uh, social, uh, social graph proofs and things like that are going to be super exciting to explore. Speaking of ZK EVMs, you know, Vitalik, you wrote and classified them in a fairly recent post of yours, and I know you've got a lot of thoughts. What are you, how are you thinking about ZK EVMs and how they're going to intersect with the future of Ethereum? Mm, well, actually, so before I answer, I should mention there's uh, one really important word that the crypto space has butchered that you forgot to mention, which is inflation. Like, remember how in, you know, good old traditional lands, inflation actually refers to, like, changes in the price level of commodities in terms of an asset? And we just, like, totally butchered it and changed it to refer to the total quantity of an asset? Yeah, that's us. We're great. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, but anyway, on the CKVM question, I think it's... Uh, 
fascinating uh, because uh, like if we step back and just think about you know like what is the uh, ideal uh, kind of technical vision of e-blockchain like what would I uh, you know love to see Ethereum look more like 10 years from now right like the uh, uh, kind of vision that I think I gave a couple of days ago is uh, imagine a world where everyone you know if, whether they're a validator or they're someone else they run a node and they just run a node on their phone so you know if you want you can even stake a million bucks of ETH on your phone and every 12 seconds a yeah, block comes in and that block contains 3.6 megabytes of data and um, you know you download 3.6 megabytes of data because these days uh, plant phone planes are getting faster and faster you and the, and you hash it and then you check it against one snark you know that checks like f like three or four polynomial equations and then that's it you just know that the block is correct all you have to do is just take 3.6 uh, megs of data, download it, you know, ch do a few uh, hash it, do a couple of polynomial checks, and you know you m magically know that this is the correct block, right? So in that kind of future, you know, running a node becomes vastly easier. Ethereum becomes much more decentralized. It becomes like this very theoretically nice and clean system in a lot of ways, but. In order to get there, like we would basically have to take the entire Ethereum machinery, both the consensus layer and the execution layer, and stick it inside of a snark. And this is always something that we've like known is theoretically possible because ultimately everything is a polynomial. Um, you know, I'm a polynomial, you're a polynomial. <laughs> but it's uh, no, polynomial is the next term we're gonna repurpose. Is what you're saying? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So. The yeah, problem, the, the, but the challenge in practice has always been like, oh, you know, how many constraints is it going to take? How much inefficiency are we going to eat? Is this actually viable? But you know, since we saw Plonk in 2019, and we saw the, uh, it, I think Plonk like unlocked a huge number of things because uh, Plonk was like, it wasn't just a protocol; it was like this meta conceptual leap when you could start separately thinking about which polynomial commitments do you, do you use to enforce your polynomial equations and how do you convert what you, want to, what you want to check into polynomial equations, right? And like you can do, answer those two questions completely separately. And so, you know, you can have, uh, you know, traditional Plonk with a KZG, traditional Plonk with, uh, you know, Fry and Starks. Um, you could have, uh, you know, pluck up with KZG, pluck up with Starks and like, basically just research those two directions separately and uh, um, and then we've just seen all of these amazing improvements you know it's, we've, we've seen pluck up which is uh, amazing for solving like pretty much all or, or making pretty much all kind of tra all traditionally snark unfriendly computation into something that's like maybe only medium snark unfriendly and then a couple of other improvements and then you know we've been seeing all this amazing work on zkvms at the same time all this amazing work on compilers to try to make it easy to compile things and then at the same time there's uh, a whole bunch of uh, companies that are quietly working on zk evm asics i'm uh, you know kind of hoping that uh, now that mining is gone the uh, you know the miners are going to retrain and become developers like literally <laughs> and you know we're going to have uh, amazing uh, companies that uh, are going to create like you know super fast zk proving hardware and like maybe in five to ten years we'll actually get there and you know you'll be able to like you know run a full node, node on your phone and like uh, you know stake as much um eth as you want and just like download 3.6 megabytes hash it and like check a couple polynomials and you know you got a good block we will have some time for predictions so i'm excited to hear what you actually want to put your foot on the ground for when it comes to what miners will do in the future that's an area that i don't think i've heard much from before okay and i guess building on this uh a natural question for myself and i'm sure many of people in the audience like how do you all see zk complementing the future of ethereum <laughs> that can mean a lot of different things. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna throw this out there and whoever wants to kind of run with it, please do. One, so one of the ways I think about for why ZK is a, a natural complement to blockchains is that blockchains give you censorship resistance and I mean, you know, guaranteed execution and a couple, you know, a couple of other guarantees, but at the cost of two really important things. One is scalability, the other is privacy. Well, what, what two properties are you know, ZK Snarks um, exactly tailored for? Scalability and privacy, right? So it's like the two almost fit together perfectly, like you know, these pieces of a puzzle, and uh, you know, one just like, completely solves the weaknesses of the other. So I think uh, you know, they're a perfect fit, and like, uh, there's a lot of applications where if you, just, uh, if you only have one, they don't make sense, but if you have both, they just suddenly start fitting together. 
like the way that I think about this is that like blockchains are creating these massive data sets and these data sets are available and public and there, there's so much rich information that's going to be there it's going to be very in, like in, in order for in order to allow people to make like proofs about this information you need privacy and you also need succinctness so like th there's some things that we can do already like we can use tools like semaphore and hanon to to make proofs about like that that you you're part of a group but like this data is so rich and 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 the the way that it's rich is it, it has social connections and interactions and like what i want to see us do in the future is to start to explore ways to make to make proofs about this kind of like shared network data that i don't know all the private information about but i can work with a group of other people in order to make a proof for example that oh i am two steps away from a certain person in the social graph that's like that's where I see some really exciting things coming in the future. And a neat thing that I'll say real quick about that is the, the transparent, the basically fully transparent nature of a blockchain and its history. This has been one of those classic examples of something that in some contexts is a feature and in some contexts it's a bug. Um, but it's neat that in this context, we're looking at ways to make it a bit more of a feature because like you said, it's an incredibly rich and verified data set, arguably the richest, most verified data set ever produced and the ability to kind of work with that using proofs in various ways is just something that is going to be really interesting and I think it's something that you've thought a lot about so yeah maybe I'll, I'll give two framings for I think the equivalent concept but from a slightly different angle because I think that um, these are useful when thinking about like what kinds of applications might be powerful in the future uh, the first is you know to, to dig into that complementary uh, framing of what ZK uh, and Ethereum have as a relationship. Um, one thing that is interesting about ZK taken, you know, just alone is that uh, in some sense ZK proofs are stateless. So I can prove, for example, that I know the pre-image of a hash that is contained in a Merkle root, but, uh, you know, why would someone care about that particular Merkle root, right? Like a common question actually that we get when we're introducing new developers into ZK is like, well, can I use a ZK proof to prove that I like know some private key of an account at this block hash? Uh, or like that I know some sort of fact about a smart contract on Ethereum? And the answer is, well, like you can't do that directly because ZK proofs are just like mathematical equations. Math is not aware of the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, however, what the Ethereum blockchain does is it allows us to come to consensus on what's important, which I think is kind of like a little bit of the flip side of um, some of Barry's and, Barry and Vitalik's framing. So we imbue a certain Merkle root or a certain block hash or cryptographic accumulator with meaning, uh, and that's what gives ZK proofs their power. That's what gives ZK proofs like their semantic meaning. Um, and then the second kind of framing that I would think about is, you know, this is to go off of Albert's comment, blockchains are, uh, it's almost kind of like an accident that in order to build something uh, like basically a consensus engine that we can all agree basically on a certain state route or something like that, all the data has to be transparent. Um, and I think that that's not necessarily like, th that's not intrinsic, you know. Uh, we can use these new tools like ZK proofs or witness encryption or whatever else. Um, to build systems where we can still come to consensus, but we don't have to make like every single thing public, which is actually like a really limiting thing in the design space of coordination mechanisms that you can build. Yeah, can you expand on that a little bit? Because one conversation that we've had with, for example, various more traditional tech companies is this idea of making the data that they have, you know, private in literally their databases available, but not available in the conventional, well, we just reveal all of it, because they're obviously not going to do that, but available in the sense of being amenable to proofs and other things that people can then use outside of those systems. Um, can, can you expand a little bit about how that might work, either at a high level, low level, really whatever has been top of mind for you there? Oh yeah, one, one thing that I think could be really interesting is like, what if we took, I mean, this is super blue sky far out, but knowing how fast ZK is going, maybe it's not actually as far out as we think. Um, imagine we took some traditional web two social company that's got an account model, whether that's like Facebook or Twitter or Reddit or something like that. Um, and on these uh, services, maybe what we could imagine is like the service provider would produce a state route for everyone's account. Now it's not going to necessarily show all of the underlying data that is underneath the state root because that might include like your password or your password hash but at the very least what they might publish is like a merkle tree of a bunch of account state roots now what you the user can do is your personal data is still 
private to you and the service provider, like whether that's Twitter or Facebook or Reddit, um, the actual data, on, only a hash commitment to that data is being shared. But you can start making ZK proofs that everyone knows uh, are actually valid and are using an attested to um, data set. You're not making something up. So you can prove, for example, that like, I am in this Facebook group, I'm in this subreddit, I have this reputation, maybe I can carry that reputation from one platform to another platform. And that I think is a really interesting like interoperability mechanism between the Web 2 world and the Web 3 world. Yeah, and one thing I want to note about that is sometimes people hear this idea and they're like, yeah, but the company, they can just change their database however they want, so why is this useful? Well, if they publish a state route, they at least can't change things after that. And by the way, a very natural place to put that state route would be on a decentralized blockchain. So I think even though it isn't anywhere near the same as like the Ethereum blockchain's history, we still get something there that is, I think, quite interesting and the ramifications of which we really haven't even scratched the surface. Um, I'm kind of moving forward here. Uh, Building on this whole, like, let's just talk about different topics, build up different vantage points to try to learn more about it. One game I like to play is uh, what I call the underrated overrated game, which is simply to say, what do you think is underrated in the space right now? And what do you think is overrated uh, in the space? So maybe let's start with, with underrated. And again, I'll kind of throw it out there to, for anyone to pick up. So I think that when we think about this question, we need to think about it in like different contexts. I think that like if we're asking this question in the context of like the Western world, that uh, I think that in the Western world we tend to over uh, overweight the value of financial privacy, um, whereas like our our societies are like for the most part free, and the 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 most important thing about our societies tends to be like who speaks and who gets to be part of discussions and how decisions are made and how we decide what to do. So I feel like that's much more important so than, than the kind of financial privacy applications. So in the Western world, I think that like social, private social media and things like that are much more interesting. In the developing world, it's completely different, right? In the developing world, it's just so, so important to have financial privacy uh, that it's like, yeah. Like one thing that I kind of was really surprised about was we're running like a quadratic funding round at DEF CON. And like a lot of the people have, have like just serious problems with like private information and they're just really, really reluctant to share their, th that information. So yeah, that's, the, that's what I think. That's really interesting also because, and I think really fitting when you consider even this DevCon, where it's located and a lot of the themes that have gone into it, which is when you try to say whether something is underrated or overrated, it's also by definition a matter of perspective. Uh, where we're looking at things really affects things. A lot of times something is underrated or overrated because it's relative to you know, something else that might be drawing more attention or not getting uh, enough attention. We continue to love to hear other thoughts of like, what's underrated or overrated uh, when it comes to ZK. Underrated is probably uh, applications of uh, ZK proofs in uh, areas that have nothing to do with uh, what we consider to be the traditional crypto space. So, you know, government records of uh, various kinds. I mean, the example of like proving things inside of social media applications, um, you know, even I mean, even games, I mean, like possibly supply chain stuff. Um, like there's just a whole bunch of um, areas where like maybe it also makes sense to put a blockchain in. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. But like even if it doesn't, it um, often makes uh, a lot of sense to stick uh, zero knowledge proofs in as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's super underrated, at least from my personal perspective, which is a lot of what we're calling ZK. Uh, doesn't require a blockchain. Uh, as we've noted, it's very complementary, but there's a lot of situations where you straight up are no longer constrained by operating on top of a blockchain. And as many people here are very familiar, uh, I love the blockchain, but it can be quite constraining to work with at times. So that's something I think will also unlock innovation uh, in new ways. Yeah, I was actually gonna jump off that as well. I think that uh, a lot of times when we categorize ZK use cases today, um, well, first of all, there's a huge bias towards use cases that are related to the blockchain. Somehow these things have become you know, almost synonymous, like uses of Z ZK and usage of ZK on a blockchain. Um, but the second thing is then when you dig into the categorization, we often break down apps into there's scalability applications and there's privacy applications. 
Uh, but I think that we're going to see a third category of thing that is like not quite either of those emerge in the near future, which is this idea of like uh, ZK Snarks' interoperability technology. And this might sound a little bit weird because interoperability is typically a word that we use more for you know when we talk about smart smart contracts talking to each other. Um, but there exists you know a rich set of basically cryptographic claims that actually you know as a matter of fact exists in the world outside of blockchains as well, whether that's uh, you know, the signatures in your, uh, like, uh, GitHub commit history, or, like, the signatures that, uh, you know, various, like, communication service providers, whether that's, like, messaging services, email services, etc., use to authenticate your messages, um, or signatures on blockchains themselves. And one of the crazy things about Snarks is that they turn these signatures into things that can talk to each other. So, we move from this world where like the RSA signature algorithm can only be understood by other parties that are running, you know, the RSA signature algorithm to being being able to put the RSA signature algorithm inside of a snark, which is sort of this like general purpose programmable cryptography construct and you can do things like I either contain this RSA private key to this GitHub account or I possess this ECDSA private key to an Ethereum account. Uh, and you can start making these like cross-platform claims. And I think that that's something that's underrated and, and hasn't been thought about enough. And you know, I know there's there's a number of like PSC and Zero X Park teams that are thinking about these things um, that are actually going to demo this week. So if you want to check out Ayush's zk email project, I think that this is a really really awesome one in particular. Um, yeah, uh, just to build on what Brian has said. So Brian was said, so one thing I think that is underrated in the space is that that. We are we're having a lot of social media experiments happening, and like I think that social media will will make internet discourse become more collectivist and less individualistic. And like the the reason that I think this is is that because when you're part of a group, when when you're when you're making like private claims, when you're making proofs that you're that you're part of a set, when you make a post, um, you need to you need to consider about the rest of the group, right? That like you, you tend to become more like protective of that group because you need to be careful about its perception and reputation. You're like a representative of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so you, you speak more as part of the group as as opposed to as part of from your own perspective. So that's super interesting. What you're saying is because we'll, these technologies will enable us, for instance, to form these groups where we simultaneously kind of get to draft off of the reputation of the group, but then we also impact the reputation of that group. Uh, you think, or you can see how it will, for instance, make thinking more collectivist in, in certain situations. Is that about right? Yeah, right. Because like I see today that like a lot of social media is, is very individualistic, right? A lot of people are focused on like more likes on Instagram or, or retweets on Twitter and things like that. And like that leads to these kind of incentives that are inherently about like performance. But when you switch the paradigm and instead of trying to get things for yourself, you're trying to gather things for your like group, the people that you're, you're speaking as part of a set of, uh, that, changes, that changes the game completely. I'm really excited to see how, how that will develop. Yeah, that's super fascinating. Um, one other thing that always jumps to mind for me right now as being underrated, and I think you guys have a lot of thoughts on this, is just the kind of community and ecosystem that exists in uh, ZK right now. What have you observed, and maybe even compare and contrast a little bit with, let's say, the more conventional crypto ecosystem, if it can even be called such a thing? Um, so a couple of things that I've observed is it tends to be that like people who are drawn to the ZK space tend to be like really technical and really just excited to learn things and do things. And that's just, that's really, really fun. The other thing that I've observed is that like, I've seen like companies who are like, competitors with each other like working together so much to like train people and audit each other's code and things like that and i think that that's just really really great yeah maybe one thing also to jump off that last point that i see as like a difference between uh i, I think this is like representative actually of applied crypto broadly not just zk crypto um, and it's true of you know the best parts of blockchain as well versus other industries is like there are natural 
I, I don't want to say like decentralizing forces, but maybe forces that encourage or incentivize like the free sharing of knowledge and information. Because if you're trying to get everyone on board with your protocol, whether that's a cryptographic protocol or a rollup, what you really need is for other people to understand and trust your system. Um, so you need to be permissively licensing your code, or at least, you know, I mean, permissively licensing is going to be sort of the gold standard because then you're going to get people digging into the actual intricacies and understanding, you know, all of the subtleties and edge cases, but I think that's something that's a really powerful effect. Yeah, one thing uh, I was actually reminded of this morning when Danny Ryan gave his talk is he said that I had said, and I honestly didn't remember saying this, but I believe him, he said that I had said that, you know, crypto is this intellectual gravity well. That's something I've absolutely felt for many years, right down to the part where I literally, again, repurposed the word crypto there. Um, and I've, the only other thing I've really seen in recent years that gives me that same feeling is what we are now calling ZK. It has a lot of these similar intellectual gravity well effects. And uh, I think for better or for worse, like blockchains are inherently financialized. Like the very invention of a blockchain is kind of introducing this incentive dimension uh, that's orthogonal to more conventional consensus theory and, and other things. Much of the core consensus theory actually existed well before blockchains did. So you can't get away from this financialized aspect of blockchains. Um, and, and that's been great in many ways. I think that's actually really uh, been a positive for a lot of the development interest in the space. But it also causes the attraction of like other forces and factors that, well, knock on wood, I think are a little bit harder to do in a ZK context, though I would never bet against the broader crypto spaces ability to figure out how to financialize the hell out of something. But right now, we are in, I think, a bit of an oasis when it comes to just being able to intellectually pursue really interesting problems that are also very practically valuable. And uh, hopefully we can preserve that for a long time. And, and hopefully it's something that other folks in the audience uh, can kind of get a, a taste of uh, in the future as well. Um, I guess now that we've sort of we've scanned the space and where it is right now in a bunch of ways. So the natural thing that I want to hear about is something I alluded to earlier, which is just uh, predictions. So predictions could be about something that will happen tomorrow, a year from now, de decades from now. Um, but yeah, what are some predictions? Hopefully not putting you on the spot too much here. So my prediction is that by 2040, someone will w have won a Nobel Peace Prize for using zero knowledge proofs. Well, that escalated quickly. <laughs> How, how, maybe say a little bit more about how that might work. <laughs> right. So, so basically, the way I think about this is that zero knowledge proofs can be are, uh, allow you to have like private interactions with people, and that means that you're able to build trust in an in, in an environment where there is no trust. And it turns out that this is really important for like the negotiations between people. So, like, kind of like the 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 easy path to this that I see is that. Um, the, the, the possession of software bugs will become so serious that there will be this crisis. And in order to overcome the crisis, we'll need to prove to each other how many software bugs each like nation state holds. So they can use a zero knowledge proof to prove that they know a software bug for Ethereum or for Firefox. And this will be the first step in decommissioning the, the software bug arsenals that people have accumulated. That's super, super interesting. Uh, remind me in uh, 18 years to check back on that. But that definitely got us off on, on a bang. Uh, other predictions that come to mind from any of you guys? Yeah, I, I have a few maybe that are less like specific and precise than Barry's and hopefully and unfortunately less like inspiring, <laughs> galvanizing. Uh, but I, I think, you know, in terms of like really large scale trends, um, I think that right now, and you can even see this reflected in the programming of this DevCon, uh, this idea of ZK applications is being seen as almost like a product or application category. Uh, and my belief is that like these new cryptographic primitives are going to be so ubiquitous that in, you know, say 20 years, uh, it's like it's going to be a, the case that 
ZK and similar primitives are just happening in the background. Like we're not going to call things ZK apps in the same way that we don't call websites HTTPS apps. I think it's like an incoherent product category. You know, similarly to how uh, we had a lot of folks calling websites dot coms or this idea of like the dot com industry. We're going to move instead to this world where you have this like massive space of applications and coordination mechanisms that require information asymmetry, which turns out to be a really, really fundamental primitive. And how that information uh, asymmetry is created is not going to be the focus. It's more going to be like, you know, much like today we have e-commerce sites or like storefronts or landing pages or browser-based games. These things rely on the existence of DNS or HTTPS, but we don't call them, again, dot coms or, or HTTPS apps today. Um, one uh, kind of medium inspiring one, I guess, that's uh, a little bit uh, less uh, intense than someone winning a Nobel Prize, but I think is still important to recalibrate our thoughts around, is that I think uh, over the next 10 years, it will become recognized that uh, ZK snarks are at least as important to technology as blockchains are. Well, that's very, that I think that is depending on your point of view, perhaps as exciting as the Nobel Peace Prize. Like I, I I'll think the Nobel Peace Prize is an amazing thing, but I'm also kind of curious to see if we can, you know, build up even alternatives or other, you know, other sort of recognition yeah. emergently. So I, you, you sort of alluded to this earlier with some of the complementary stuff, like how ZK complements blockchains. When you say as important, uh, that also implies like, how do you think blockchains are important? You also talked about that. So maybe can you tie that for, together to help us understand it a bit more? Sure. I and mean, so I think uh, like you can look at, uh, at uh, ZK both as uh, massively enhancing what blockchains can do and possibly even being a necessary ingredient in, get in uh, blockchains, be it getting to like the real high scale levels of uh, high scalability that uh, a lot of applications require, and you could also think of um, you know, ZK applications uh, beyond the uh, block, uh, blockchain space, right? So, for the uh, first one, like we you know, we talked a lot about rollups, we talked about ZK VMs, we talked about um, you know, my dream for the look and feel of running an Ethereum validator in 2032, and uh, you know. Prototypes of this may even come much, much faster than 2032. I don't know. You know, these people are insane. Um, but uh, the yeah, and you know, without this kind of technology, like it would actually take a lot more sacrifices to get blockchains to you know hundreds of thousands of uh, transactions a second, right? So that's the first part. And then the second part is um, just uh, you know the the kinds of things that zk snarks would enable. Like even if we just Imagine a world where like blockchains as a technology don't exist and are turned off and you just ask the question of like Okay, you know the world is uh, dominated by um, you know Facebook and uh, Google and uh, you know w Whatever stuff the uh, Chinese government supports and you know we're stuck with that uh, But uh, you know how do we make at least uh, some of these better right and it's uh, the well you know, giving people privacy guarantees while at the same time being able to compute over information is uh, huge, right? Uh, being able to have financial systems that prove solvency to people is uh, huge. Um, having uh, social media systems where you can vote um, anonymously and uh, actually have a yeah, credible guarantee that your vote is being uh, is being included, or even just like a guarantee that, like, let's say. Yeah, you know, tw instead of Twitter having some opaque proprietary algorithm, Twitter has an algorithm that's actually open source. And uh, that, uh, but then also Twitter actually being able to prove that it's following its algorithm. Like, that's huge, right? So, even if we kind of, you know, turn off blockchains and just, uh, you know, imagine, like, what's the difference between a world with no ZK and a world with ZK? Like, it's really kind of epochal gains in. Um, you know things uh, like uh, privacy and just being able to have a more you know free and and, and uh, open and cooperative world in just so many ways, right? And then once you add blockchains on top, then you know the gains are obviously compounding. Yeah, one thing I think is really cool is I think we're past the point where we're worried about whether blockchains are going to continue to be a thing, so to speak. But I remember even several years ago telling people. Look, no matter what happens with blockchains, part of its positive legacy on the world is going to be that it really complemented and accelerated research and development in just cryptography, more advanced cryptography, which is really what ZK is kind of becoming this, like, again, like I keep saying, catch all term for. Um, but since we have a bit of time to, like, dig in a little bit more on the future, I don't know how far we can get in the weeds on this, but what are some of these other sort of ZK adjacent 
future technologies that might be interesting, you know, like homomorphic encryption or indistinguishability obfuscation or just other stuff in, in that category. Anything that like jumps to mind is just like, keep an eye out, maybe not too much of an eye out because we are pretty far from, from some of this stuff, but yeah, anything that hops to mind for you guys? Yeah, so the way that I think about this is that uh, yeah, so my, my answer is MPC, and the, why I think it's so important is that... Sorry, can you say what MPC is? Uh, Multi-party computation. And the, the reason why I think this is important is that ZKPs let you make proofs about secrets that you know. And like, it turns out that there's a whole bunch of things in our world with secrets of, that, that only I know. Like I know my private key for my GitHub commit keys. Um, but our world has much more private information than that, right? There's all, like the richest information is, is to do with like social networks and social interactions. And if we want to make proofs about that, we'll need to be able to make proofs about shared secrets. And that's what multi-party computation lets you do. It allows you to make proofs about, about shared secrets. So I think that we can leverage these kind of things to make this kind of like proofs of connection in social graphs where you don't know anyone's connections other than you, yourselves, your own. Hmm. Well, I think the uh, big kind of prize of prizes in cryptography that it's uh, worth talking about is uh, obfuscation. Right, because uh, uh, obfuscation basically lets you turn a program into an encrypted program, but where you can run that encrypted program and it has the same outputs on the same inputs. But if that program, the original program's source code had secrets inside of it, the encrypted program would not let you extract those secrets. It would only let you just run the exact code on the um, on the yeah, secrets and the inputs and give you the outputs. Right. So the reason, like one way to see how obfuscation is so powerful is like. Pretty much any other cryptographic primitive can be yeah, done with um, op with obfuscation, right? So, um, you know, if uh, you want to, let's say, yeah, turn like make signatures out of uh, obfuscation, right? Then uh, the way that you would do it is you would, uh, you know, say take any symmetric signature scheme. So, like, you know, take something where you just like generate a big hash and you you know add the data to uh, to the hash and just like some really simple thing. Then you would take the, the, the private key, just like is the encryption key of that, and then the public key, well, you would stick the encryption, your, your key into the obfuscated program, and then you would set it to decrypt, and you just publish the obfusc, or so you set it to encrypt, and you'd publish an obfuscated encryptor. Another one is just is uh, zero knowledge proofs themselves, ironically, right? You'd basically just, uh, you know, literally uh, create an obfuscated program where you'd be able to just like stick in a piece of code and it would run that piece of code and sign it with a key that it has internally and give you the output, right? And that gives you possibly the best possible ZK snark because to verifying it is super simple. To verify, you literally just verify one signature, right? And then you could do really fancy stuff on top, like, uh, you know, you could make a, uh, encrypt data uh, in such a way that that data can only be encrypted if someone gives you a proof that something happened on a blockchain, right? So the the applications of that, like, you know, just multiply really massively. The, the problem with um, this kind of obfuscation, unfortunately, is that, like, we've only uh, had the first formally proven candidates for this, like, literally two years ago, and they're just insanely uh, high in their complexity at the moment, right? Like, it, it takes, uh, it's, there's, like, six levels of um, you know, protocols inside of protocols inside of protocols and there's this big tower and like actually running it would take you know like a billion years or something and you know the question is you know are the very smart people going to be able to like bring that down to the point where it's something viable 10 or 20 years from now and like we'll see i think uh, if we get to the uh, uh, like something viable then you know the results of that could be amazing yeah and What's gonna be really interesting is to see, like you said, the, the rate of progress here. I remember myself, I think it was back in 2012 or 2013, before I was even interested in blockchains, I first got exposed to the concept of fully homomorphic encryption. I was visiting a former intern of mine who also went to the same university, and she described it as like, for example, say you have a keyboard, but it's built in a way where you press a key and the keyboard doesn't know what key you pressed, and yet like the right kind of keystroke registers, and then she was like, oh, by the way, we're only 11 orders of magnitude away from this actually being viable. I was like, hold on, did you say 11 orders of magnitude? She's like, yeah, 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 11 orders of magnitude. Um, but you know, in the years that have passed, I mean, we've chopped that number down quite a bit. Depending on the, the context, we're anywhere from even one order of magnitude, but probably more like two or three orders of magnitude away. Um, that's a lot of progress, and it, it's gonna be, like I said, really exciting to just keep working on this and seeing what uh, we, we can unlock. And we've even seen some of that, I think, like with your experiences building uh, in, in the browser 
today compared to, to three years ago. What are some of like the numbers or rough ballpark? Oh uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's something like, uh, it, it depends on how exactly you interpret all the different computational resources, but since 2018, we might say that we've seen like three orders of magnitude improvement in how large of ZK snarks you can prove in the browser, so. Yeah, totally. Uh, to make that more concrete, some of the things I've seen out of Zero X Park involve waiting for, you know, 45 seconds, maybe 90 seconds, uh, not perfect, but viable, right? Like you can see situations where someone would be willing to wait, you know, one to two minutes for something. And that exact same thing two and a half, three years ago, literally would have involved maybe two hours or just actually would not have been uh, computationally or feasible for other reasons in terms of like memory or, or things of that sort. So that's to give everyone a bit of a taste of kind of the direction uh, we've been going in, at least in some subsets of this space. And, uh, you know, hopefully it'll continue. It, hopefully, uh, some of the folks in the audience can also get involved and, and help us with that. Um, and on that note, a quick question, just like, are there good places to, quote, get started? It's always like a very tricky thing, even for <laughs> crypto more broadly. Um, but I know that you guys have worked on various uh, resources. So are there any like just quick things we can mention here? And of course, if you really want to get more involved, you'll want to follow up more afterward. Yeah, so on our end, one of our focuses is like education and community development. Um, so we run these applied ZK learning groups and we're doing our best right now to get all of those materials online at learn.zeroxpark.org. So that's, you know, an effort by various like community members and volunteers. I think like Michael Chu and John Guibas are probably around here right now. Um, so that's a collection of videos, articles, various documents. Um, that have exercises on how to just get started with like writing your first circuits. Cool, yeah. so that's a learn.zeroxparc.org. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the first thing I would recommend is to don't get intimidated by all of the moon maths to black box things out and to figure out what something does, not how it does it. And you can use that to build a whole bunch of things. And as you're building those bunch of things, you can figure out how the thing does what it does. And like, that's, that's how I learned and it was, it was really enjoyable. The other thing that I would suggest people check out is you can check out the, the privacy and scaling exploration team's website. It's appliedzkp.org. And we have a Discord there. You can join and chat and ask questions. So that's appliedzkp.org. Yes. Yeah, I mean, I th there's, I think, a lot of different resources and like for people with, um, you know, different uh, like skill levels and like and different interests, like there's uh, there's environments now where that are literally online, like, you know, zkrepo.dev, I think was uh, one, right? And where you can just, uh, you know, literally go and like start writing the code for a yeah, ZK yeah, circuit and like compile it and it just outputs to you a piece of Solidity code that you can then, you know, stick on. Well, these days, not mainnet, because it would be a, a bit too expensive, but, um, you know, some uh, the uh, layer two or test out of your choice. And, and uh, you know, you can actually kind of play around and see if you can make some simple uh, some simple application. So that's uh, one way to learn for some people. If you want to get into the math, then, um, you know, the uh, applied zkp.org page has, I think, a lot of good uh, resources. Um, zkp.science has a bunch. Um, I mean, I have a bunch that I've, uh, you know, that I've written. There's uh, a bunch that the Starkware team has written. There's there's quite a lot these days. Like just, uh, I mean, sometimes it even makes sense to uh, read like multiple ex explainers on the same topic so you can see how they fit together. Um, yeah. So you know, depending on like which side of things uh, you want to learn, there's like you know there's plenty of different resources for you. Um, yeah, just one other thing I wanted to add that like uh, we've given examples of how you can join if you want to be a developer But as we talked about earlier like there's a whole bunch of like community and ecosystem and cultural things that are also super important And like I'm not sure how to get involved in doing that like uh, maybe you could join some of our like uh, uh, private social media experiments, there's skitter and Hanon and Yeah, you can find it on applyzkp.org or zeroxparks website um, or you could you could explore running a quadratic funding round or things like that. Yeah. yeah, there are definitely ways to get involved that don't imply you have to get into programming or math side of things because the goal of all of this is to touch so much more than just you know those areas. And, and a really neat thing that's emerged literally since the last DevCon is some of these experiments that, among other things, just need and want more people to, to get involved and uh, to participate in the networks that are being uh, built. Um, so. I guess to, to kind of wrap things up here, uh, we've talked a lot about a lot of stuff here today. We've talked about big stuff, future stuff, some uh, deeply technical stuff. 
but one of the things that I personally love the most about Ethereum is, it's, is that Ethereum has this quote unquote uh, soul. And so I'd like to close with a bit more of a personal touch. Uh, you know, we all started somewhere, we were all noobs and, and frankly continue to be noobs uh, to this very day. Uh, any like just stories or even fun anecdotes from what's it, when you first got interested in Ethereum, when you first got interested in ZK or, or anything else? Any, anything you guys could share? Sure, so I first, yeah, so in 2017, I think I deleted my Facebook and I deleted it because I was getting worried about like the, the kind of surveillance state and the ability, not really surveillance state, but the ability of like Facebook to manipulate me with like ads and showing me happy memories and things like that. And like when I deleted my, <laughs> when, when I deleted my Facebook, I, I didn't realize that, I, well, I kind of realized that at the time, but afterwards I felt this loss. Like, I mean, I lost connection to like so many people. I lost like a social network that I've been building for years. And that was like, it, I still feel that loss today. Like, I don't know who I went to school with, like how many kids they have and things like that. And like, I didn't realize that it was connected at the time, but soon afterwards I, I got really interested in Ethereum and I tried to build like a, a t-shirt cooperative. I wanted, I wanted to build a way for people to, to pull their money together so they could get a bulk discount on purchasing like cool and fun t-shirts that there would be like designers and then they would get like a bulk discount. So I'm like, I didn't realize that at the time again, but like now when I look back, I feel like when I lost Facebook, I sort of lost this community. And since then I've been sort of searching for one and that's what kind of brought me to Ethereum. Thank you for sharing that. It, I first heard the story very recently from you and I was like, wow, I, I didn't realize kind of how deep, and, and it explains a lot of why you've had all these really fascinating and wonderful experiments in the social uh, media direction. And, and it's also just a great reminder that again, the goal, at least my goal and our goal here is to utilize these technologies in a way where we can more precisely get what we want out of technology and social systems and, and things of that sort. Yeah, I can give a story about how I first got involved in Ethereum. Um, Albert was actually the one who brought me into the space back in like 2018. And I remember I spent like two months over the summer of 2018 just like trying to go through and just understand like what Ethereum was. And I just remember having so much trouble and I was so frustrated. And you know, perhaps this is like, this is either an indictment of the quality of educational resources at the time, but I think it's more an indictment of myself. <laughs> <laughs> and my, um, my ability to onboard. So ever since then, um, education has been a really big focus for a lot of the communities, I would say in the Xerox Park ecosystem. Um, and that's why, you know, I mean, even just last year, how learn.zeroxpark.org got started uh, was I was talking with Jeff Lau from ENS who had done one of our applied ZK learning groups. And he had also expressed like, you know, this similar sentiment about coming into ZK and the both of us were obviously really glad that we'd like pushed through that initial uh, like, you know, hump on the learning curve. Um, and, you know, in no small part due to the fact that people in this community are so welcoming and so willing to share knowledge. Uh, and that's, uh, you know, Jeff ended up playing a huge part in putting together a bunch of different educational resources. Um, so I would say that like, you know, if you're like coming up to a new topic, even if you're scared or intimidated, um, like I myself literally took like three months <laughs> to just get a picture of what Ethereum even was. Like eventually I was like, I can't understand any of these blog posts. Let me just go to the yellow paper and like try to read it like line by line. <laughs> um, and eventually we, we actually did end up putting together a series of resources to summarize all of that stuff that made its way up to like ethereum.org among other places. Uh, so, you know, one, don't be afraid, but also two, uh, right after you have learned a thing is also, I think, the best time to, to give back and really uh, solidify those learnings by sharing them with other people. Cool, and I'll, I guess I'll close this out with a much smaller, sort of a, just a cute story. When, when I first started following Ethereum, I mainly followed it through Reddit. And I remember, you know, seeing this user, u slash vbooterin, on Reddit, and it, it was really interesting. I was like, oh, this, this V. Buterin fellow, he seems really smart, but also kind and wise. And for, 
I think like three or four months, I literally was just like, oh, vBootering is probably some like 60 year old, like Soviet era programmer. <laughs> um, and uh, I was genuinely shocked when I discovered um, how old or how young uh, Vitalik was uh, at the time. But yeah, it, it's just really funny and interesting to reflect back on. And, and in some ways it ties into some of these other things, which is, because in my case, I hadn't really bothered to go and learn more about the, the person underneath it. Um, but it was, it's a neat little snapshot of like, hey, you have this sort of identifier. And then they're just commenting. They're sharing information, they're sharing their thoughts. And I was like evaluating that and only that and drawing my own conclusions. And I think there are positive aspects of that that we can pull into some of these like social systems and other things um, that we're, we're trying to build. Uh, so on that note, just wanna once again, thank you Vitalik, Barry, Gubsheep, and all of you for joining us here today. Uh, hope you learned something, hope you enjoyed the conversation, and hope you enjoy the rest of DEF CON.